Welcome to our fourth in a series of videos on standard steel trusses. This is from chapter 7, section 3, and this is video D, the fourth. In this case, we're going to be sizing floor trusses for the 30 by 30 column grid. So in the previous videos, we looked at how these trusses are manufactured. We looked at the design resources in the form of tables that allow us to do preliminary design. And uh, in the third video, we sized the trusses for the 30 by 30 roof. And now we're going to design the floor for the 30 by 30 column grid. Uh, for the roof, we use K trusses. In the case of the floor, we're going to use LH trusses. Uh, again, we could use K trusses. We'd have to space them really closely together and they'd be really difficult to fireproof, uh, which is my major motive for using LH trusses. But some people use only K trusses in their design uh, and simply use more of them in the floor. And that is, from a structural point of view, a completely valid way to do this. So again, this is the uh, framing plan. There's a column every 30 feet on center in both directions. We have perimeter girders, interior girders, and joists uh, supporting the floor. And the joists are spaced five inches on center. So each joist supports a swash of floor that's five inches wide. And each uh, perimeter girder is basically at its vertices going to support half of a joist. So this joist right here delivers half of its load there and half of its load there. So the joist on a perimeter girder are going to be loaded at each of the joints by half whatever the total gravity load is or total factored load that's associated with that joist. So uh, we talked about before the fact that if we do a floor that's two inch corrugation and we make it six inches thick and we make it out of lightweight concrete and then we add some estimated weight for hanging ductwork off of it and hanging a ceiling and we run all these numbers, we came up with a dead load as an imposed load of uh, 49 pounds per square foot of concrete, 1.62 uh, pounds per square foot for the steel, one pound for the ductwork, one pound for the ceiling, and all that adds up to 53 pounds per square foot as the total dead load. So if we multiply the five feet times 53 pounds per square foot, we end up with 265 pounds per linear foot along those elements, and this is the same number that we used when we sized beams. We also are going to use 100 pounds per square foot for the live load times 5 feet, which is 500 pounds per foot. And we could add all those together, um, but in fact, uh, we're not going to do that because we're in the LRFD method. So we'll just go straight to this uh, spreadsheet in order to understand how we're going to do it. So we're going to flip over here. I'm going to pull up the active spreadsheet. Here we're talking about the design of floor truss joists and truss girders. Again, we have as an input 30 feet for the length of the joist, 30 feet for the length of the girder. Again, I remind you, this is an active spreadsheet. So you can put whatever number in there you want to, and all the numbers downstream of there get uh, adjusted accordingly because they're all, when appropriately uh, needed, referenced back to these key numbers. So we're going to talk first about the design of the joist, and for the floor joist, we're going to use the LH series trusses. Uh, the joist spacing is 5 feet, P dead is 53 pounds per square foot, P live is 100 pounds per square foot. When we create the factored load, it's 1.2 W dead plus 1.6 W live, which is what we call W total factored. In this number right here, we can go look at the formula and we see it's 1.2 times B9, so that's W dead, plus 1.6 times B11, 
which is W Live. And again, I remind you, we did W Dead, and then we put W Live down here. And then, um, in between, we put the factored load, which is not the normal sequence with which you would calculate things, or at least not the normal sequence with which you would present it. Um, but we put it in this sequence to help facilitate reading the tables for the LH series. So again, W is, uh, I can look at this formula and we see it's uh, B6, which is the five foot width times B7, which is the area distributed live load. So W is equal to PS, or in other words, that cell times that one. And likewise, for the live load, uh, W live is gonna equal PS, again, P live times S, so S is five, which is cell B6. And then P live is cell B8. So five times 100 is equal to 500. And I put this in red because in the tables, that number is presented as red. And I'm just trying to help you visualize it. That's a little confusing though, because you don't make up this number. It's automatically calculated from these other numbers. On the other hand, in this spreadsheet, anything you're supposed to look up, I've put in in red also, uh, just to alert you that these are lookup numbers that require some action on your part. So this is red because that's the, the color in the tables. These are red just to get your attention and tell you that that's something on your, your to-do list. All right, so from the Steel Joist Institute design tables for LH trusses, uh, we have a solution here, and so we're going to go back and figure out where that came from. And we'll pull this up at full screen. So, here we have some 18-inch deep trusses, which go 30 feet, but, um, and I should have noted more carefully before we came here, you may remember it, but just to make sure that you do, the numbers we're looking for in this table are 1,118, 1118, and 500. So now I'm gonna go back here and we're gonna find those. This one works, we're at 30 feet. This one works for total load, but not for live load. But this one works for total load and live load because 507 is greater than 500 and 1242 is substantially larger than 1118. Now, one of the things you'll note here is we just barely made it on deflection, but we're over designed for strength. And that's a common phenomenon that we observe when we pick a beam or excuse me, a truss in this case, that's too shallow or fairly shallow is it exhibits um, too much deflection. But this is 21 pounds per linear foot, and this, tr this truss is completely satisfactory. However, uh, we have this typical rule, particularly with joists, that we're going to scan the tables until we find the lightest one. So I'm going to go from 20 inch deep depth to 24. So when I do that, by the way, you'll notice I no longer have 30 feet listed across here. So then I have to fall back on this portion of the plot that says, okay, this is a fairly deep truss. It's not moment limited. So the depth is not the crucial issue. The crucial issue is how much load is tending to fail the web members. In other words, it's a shear failure kind of process. So the number we're looking for, we need to go back and find that number. And that number is right here. W total factored is 33,540. So let's say that's roughly 33,600 because we know we're going to have to factor in the weight of the truss anyway. So we're going to come back here and we're going to say 33,600. Whoops, that's not what I want to do. So 33,600, this one does not work, but that one does. 
So a 24 LH08, which weighs about 18 pounds per foot, is more than strong enough to carry that load. Um, clearly, any of these heavier ones within the 24 series wouldn't be interesting because we're just expending material we don't need to expend. When we look down at 28 LH08, we see that this one works also, just barely. This is 33,750. We were at 33,540 or something like that. Um, but we're not even going to check that one, first of all, because this is too close. But second of all, we don't need to go to a 28 inch deep truss because this one works fine. They both have the same weight. This one has a greater shear capacity. So we're going to go with that one as the lightest truss that will work. So 28, 24 L8, LH08 uh, weighing 18 pounds per foot. So we're going to come over here and we write 28, 24 LH08. That's 24 inches deep and it weighs 18 pounds per foot. Now, there's some numbers run here just for, for drill. This number is um, the length of the joist, which is cell A3, times 12. 12 will convert that from feet to inches. And then we divide by C18, which is this cell right here, which is the depth. And uh, we could have done this in our head because it's a 30 foot long truss and 24 inches deep means it's two feet deep. So the ratio is 15 and that's within our guidelines, but tending towards the deep end. And that's the situation with girders is because they're heavily loaded. Um, the shear forces are fairly high. That means the web members tend to be inherently more towards the fat end or less vulnerable to buckling. And as a consequence, we can make them longer uh, as a way to make the truss deeper and to give our cord members better lever arm. So this is a nice deep truss and it's, uh, it's uh, going to be a very efficient truss and it only weighs 18 pounds per foot. Now the joist self weight is going to equal um, this number divided by five and actually um, B6 is the spacing and the better way I should write this, which I did before um, when we did uh, roof trusses, is the following. I'm going to say every foot of joist weighs that much. So I'm going to put that cell on the top. And I'm going to say if we're going to do the area distributed weight that's associated with that in order to make some estimate of how many pounds per square foot of building we need. Um, we're going to divide by the spacing times one foot because there's a one foot dimension of floor associated with that one linear foot of joist and there's a five foot width associated with the width of the swash of floor that that one foot is supporting. So we've taken this 18, we divided by five square feet and we get 3.6 pounds per square foot of floor. This number is larger than what we got for the roof, which shouldn't surprise us because we have much larger loads here. Um, instead of 20 pounds of dead and 20 pounds of live, we at live we have 53 pounds a square foot of dead and 100 pounds per square foot of live. So this number is higher, although if you took the ratio of this number to these loads, you would get a lower number, or if you took the ratio of this to that, you'd discover that these floor joists are more efficient because the loads are higher, the members are inherently fatter, the members are inherently less vulnerable to buckling, which means that the members will be more efficient in carrying load if you can get them away from the buckling realm. Okay, so, uh, here's what we have to do next. We had this 
factored load associated with what we know, which was the dead imposed in W Live, it came out to be 118, uh, 1118. We now need to add, and I guess I need to. Uh, Adjust the spreadsheet slightly so you can read it. We need to add 1.2 times W self for the joist to that former factored load. So when I look at this formula, by the way, it says it's equal to B10, which is this right here. So that's these two factors. And then we're adding in 1.2 times E18, which is this number. And so our 1118 has now gone up to 1140, which is the total load per linear foot associated with the joist, including the factored self weight of the joist, the factored dead weight of the decking and or the imposed dead and the factored um, load per linear foot associated with the live load. Now, um, we're going to multiply that number times the length of the joist to come up with this total number. So it's this number times A3, which uh, is the length of the joist. This gives us the total factored load, capital W, associated with the entire joist and all the loads on the joist. So W factored is one way of looking at it is it's this cell times the length and this is the formula written out here for what's in that cell. Um, this right here, when I click on it, this is what Excel understands right up here in the formula bar. Um, whoops. I didn't mean to do that. Okay, um, but this is just a graphics program called MathType, which allows me to express this in a way that's uh, more visually apparent to you. All right, so now I want to design the girders, and we've got this number of 34,188 pounds of total factored fo force associated with the joist. We're going to divide that number by a thousand to get it into kips and that will be the weight on an interior joist vertex. And the reason is that an interior, excuse me, an interior girder takes half of the joist on one side and half of the joist on the other. So effectively every vertex of the girder has a full joist and all its associated factored load on it. And then we're going to take half that much on each of the vertices of the perimeter girder. And so these formulas are written out here also. So now we're ready to go uh, design our girders. And we're going to take that number and repeat it right here in that number and repeat it right there. And those are the uh, total factored force uh, that we have to design for. So when we go into the LH, excuse me, into the girder tables, we're going to discover that the, the bracketing forces on the vertices for the LRFD portion of the table are 18 and 16.5 and that they have a uh, weight from the tables, the self weight of the girder of 47 pounds per foot and 42. So let's go look at that. Um, so we want to go here and we'll blow that up. So again, we have a span of 30 feet. We have six spaces for a five foot spacing between the girders. And again, we're given an option of 24, 28, 32, or 36 inch deep girders. 
and efficiency would suggest you go to the deeper end and and I know that all along I've been saying to you find the lightest member find the lightest member and I'm now changing up the rules and the reason I am is that um, my experience economically is that if we can keep these things shallower uh, we're going to be able to either have higher ceilings for better daylighting or a lower overall height for the building which improves the economy of the building and we may have both so for right now I'm going to pick a 24 inch deep uh, truss because I know it has good proportions and I know it will perform fairly well although when we get over here and we look at the bracketing numbers 18 kips and 16.5 kips we see um, a truss here that weighs 47 we could get down to 33 so the nice thing about your spreadsheet is you have lots of options about how to play with it and you can run these numbers and start finding out how that affects the number of pounds per square foot of building and that can in fact then be turned into cost estimates uh, for the building but for right now I'm going to pluck out the 42 and 47 as the bracketing weights that are associated with these loads which are the loads that bracket what we're doing here and uh, um, those loads are 18 kips and 16.5 so I want to go back to our spreadsheet here and we put 18 and 16.5 and 47 and 42 and by the way again the formula that allows us to arrive at this 44 which is the 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 design weight or self weight of the girder that would be associated with this much load which is the design load um, we're ending up with a 44 pound per linear foot girder in the in the interpolation we can see it makes sense this is 42 that's 47 this is closer to that than it is to that this is closer to that than it is to that uh, but this interpolation formula is written out in the spreadsheet down below and it's implemented in this cell so this is the Excel version of that formula and this is the more visual version so we're, we got a 44 pound per linear foot um, and I'm going to remove that well, let's just see that says that I want to make sure that formula is actually right because it's not because I wrote that formula in and then changed the spreadsheet so the cells it's referencing uh, are no longer uh, active so we got rid of that okay so now we want to design this girder we have 34.19 uh, kips per vertex for this uh, interior girder and we're going to go look for the bracketing and this says 37.5 and 30 and the weights that we're bracketing are 178 so we're going to come here zoom in and 37.5 and 30 are the bracketing forces the bracketing weights are 178 um, so now we can go back and look at our spreadsheet we have 178 we have 37.5 and 30 and this number is in fact between those two numbers and when we work it out we have a truss that weighs 90.3 pounds per foot so again we have summarizing information about the dimensions and uh, material consumed in all of this our girder depth in every case we picked 24 inches and by the way uh, we picked 24 for our joist also what's interesting is the joist has an end bearing assembly of 5 inches and so what that means is that the decking actually sits 5 inches up above the girder or another th way of thinking of it is, is the top of the girder is 5 inches below the top of the joist so what controls the depth of this overall structural sandwich is the depth of the girder plus the 5 inch end bearing assembly so we have 29 inches 
for the overall depth of the assembly, uh, which is driven by the depth of the girders. And the tables don't offer us a girder any shallower than that. Uh, we could ask for one and we could get one. It would be heavier, but there's a limit um, beyond which uh, they wouldn't fabricate it because it becomes too efficient or too illogical. Okay, so again, the proportions are L over D. The span L is 30 feet. The depth is 2 feet, 24 inches. So we have a 15 to 1 ratio of length to depth, which again is a pretty efficient uh, proportion for a truss. These numbers, 90.3 gets copied down here, 44 gets copied down there. This 44 we divide by half the length of a, of a, a joist, and if we wanted to go through this all again, we could divide by the area that's associated with that. Uh, let me just see something here, by the way. Okay, so basically uh, we could say every linear foot weighs this much. So that's E56. We come down to that cell and it's E56. Every linear foot of girder has a self-weight of 44 pounds. On the other hand, every linear foot of girder is associated with an area of floor, which is one foot corresponding to the dimension along the girder. And its dimension in the other direction is halfway across to the next girder. In other words, this would be 15 feet times 1 feet, or 15 square feet, and when you divide that into 44, we get 2.93. Likewise, we have a similar formula for this one, except we take the full width of the joist, so it would be a formula that looks like this. And again, I'm throwing in this 1. It doesn't actually change anything. I'm just trying to express in a way that's most understandable what the computation is that we're performing. So when we add this as the weight per square foot associated with interior girders, that's the weight per square foot associated with perimeter girders, and this is the weight per square foot associated with the joist. When we add all those things together, we get this number, and that number is not correct. I'm sorry, it is correct. It's the average weight per square foot of uh, girders, and every portion of the floor is supported by a, a joist and girders, and um, this is the average for the girders. And so when we run it all together, we add that number to the number up above, which is this number right here. And I think I'll make that bold also. We add those two together and we get 6.57 pounds per square foot. So this is about three times or more than three times what we had for the dead loads, I mean for the roof um, self-weight. However, keep in mind that the loads of 100 pounds per square foot for live load is five times as great, and the dead load is almost three times as great. Um, so it's not too surprising that this is substantially larger, and it turns out if you took the ratio of the self-weight of the structure to the loads that it has to resist, this would be more efficient. This floor structure will be more efficient than the roof structure was. Uh, one other thing I will mention is uh, in, the, in the previous video, we were kind of worried about whether we could extrapolate and determine the weight of the uh, perimeter girders, and you'll notice I didn't make too much of a fuss over that. 
and the reason is that in the end the perimeter girders are going to be larger than whatever we're sizing here. This is kind of what they have to be to handle the gravity loads, but the perimeter girders are also going to support a substantial burden in the weight of the walls and depending upon the construction of the walls that might be a fairly modest amount of material or it may be a substantial amount of material um, but whatever this number is keep in mind that these perimeter girders are probably going to be heavier than that because they're also going to serve additional roles from a structural point of view So that ends our fourth series, our fourth video in this series on standard steel trusses. Um, and it's the second dealing with the sizing of the spanning members for the 30 by 30 column grid. The first one was for roof trusses and this one is for floor trusses. So we've sized LH trusses, perimeter girder trusses, interior girder trusses, and found the total amount of weight associated with that spanning system.